All right, so we're going to do a panel that's very relevant to all European countries. So it's about um, individualism, tribalism in welfare states. And we have speakers you already know. So I think Hello, except ben. ben has not been introduced yet because you haven't spoken yet, you're on tomorrow morning. So Ben Bayer is a fellow at uh, the Ayn Rand Institute and um, writes a lot of our brilliant material for New Idea. So um, yeah, please take it away, guys. All right, thank you, uh, thank you, Annie. Uh, thanks, everybody. So this is, I, I think what we're gonna do with this panel is we're gonna leave a lot of time, and I mean it this time, uh, for questions. So any questions that you feel have gone unanswered uh, so far, um, or you, you're eager to ask, or you were in line and it, it didn't get to you, then feel free to, to, to ask the questions here. I know for laws there were a number of people who, who didn't get to ask, and I think for some of the other sessions. So mostly we're gonna be answering your questions. So start thinking about what you would like, given everything you've heard today, what you would like to, to talk about, or what, what you'd like us to talk about, what you'd like to ask about, and uh, prepare to sprint over there to the, uh, to the microphone uh, on the side. I think, I mean, I'll get it started, and then we'll go to Ben and, and, and Lars. We're each gonna say a few things to kind of get the conversation started, but really this is gonna be up to you to ask, uh, ask good questions, so uh, to get some good content out. Um, I mean, I, I wanna talk a little bit about how I think, and I mentioned this in my talk earlier, how I think the welfare state reinforces tribalism and, and creates fertile ground for tribalism and how capitalism actually reinforces individualism and encourages individualism and that, you know, I think why, why America stayed as good as it, is, as it has been is because it adapted the welfare state relatively late in, in the, uh, in the in relatively, relatively late to Europe. So it only really adopted a, a systematic welfare state in the 1960s, whereas Europe uh, really, in Germany, it was started in the 19th century, and the rest of Europe, uh, probably post-World War II, really embraced full-on a, 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 a welfare state. So think about what a welfare state does, and, and even a regulatory state, just government intervention, government coercion in the economy and in our lives, what that does. It basically creates lots of zero-sum games. It basically creates lots of zero-sum relationships where some people gain literally at the expense of others. Um, think about it in terms of, in terms of regulations. You know, uh, um, we, regulate, we regulate some banks in one way, we regulate other banks in a different way. In the United States, we have all kinds of banks, small banks, medium-sized banks, big banks, that are all regulated differently. And then we have investment banks and commercial banks and other banks or brokerage houses, and they're all regulated differently. And they're all, in some sense, competing with one another, but they also uh, have, have distinct business models. And now, if I regulate one of them in a way that allows them to compete if, 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 with me, if you regulate laws, you know, in a way that allows him to compete with my bank and gives him advantages over my bank, I have now an incentive to go to all the people in my industry and team up together and create a little coalition, a little tribe, if you will, and go pound, you know, the table in front of politicians and threaten them and lobby them and give them money and bribe them and whatever to try to get the same favorable regulations that laws has for me. And maybe even give me a little advantage over laws which give then laws the incentive to go out, you know, even though we might both be pro laissez-faire capitalist guys, right? But what are we gonna do? The government's intruding on our freedoms and his incentive is now to go find a group of people who are in the same position he is and try to lobby government to now, you know, equalize the regulatory regimes or infringe on my rights. And it's very difficult to find a particularly a on the short run, an incentive for both of us to team up and go and fight against regulations broadly, completely. Because that alienates the politicians. They, they like the power, they like the control, and we might get screwed by what they're doing, right? So it creates this mentality of me, I think in Ankar's slide, when he talked about tribalism, it was us against them. And regulations 
create this mentality of us against them, right? They're regulated more or less than I am, and now it's a competition, and, and it's a competition of force because it's a competition of giving money to politicians to impose the use of force and coercion over the different parties. And it, it's a competition that usually only works in one direction, which is anti-freedom, only works in the direction of more and more and more and more. And of course, the same thing happens in the welfare state. You know, my money is being taken from me. It's given to a group over there. Uh, I want to protect my money, and they want to protect their benefits. And now there's another group that once they saw those guys got benefits, they want benefits, they create a little group. And Ayn Rand really, I mean, she spends a lot of time in uh, various essays describing the, 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 the politics of pull. And, and of course, in Atlas Shrugged, if you've read Atlas Shrugged, much of what she describes in Atlas Shrugged is about all the various statist groups, you know, fighting among each other for the spoils. And this really creates these tribes. And it's not a typical way of thinking about tribes. They might not be unified by race, or they might not be unified by any particular obvious characteristic, but it creates them a tribe of what in the media is called special interest groups or pressure groups that are now have this incentive to just increase statism and, and to, 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 to manipulate the system in their favor at the expense of somebody else. It's always at the expense of somebody because it's always a zero-sum game. It's not about creating. It's not about building. It's not about making. It's not about, it's about redistributing. It's about taking from some and giving to others. So there is this real cycle within the welfare state of uh, getting worse and worse and then and, 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 and increased tribalism. And then once in a while, a, a political party might come into power because everybody's now fed up and they might liberalize things a little bit. They make, th make things a little bit better for a while, reduce regulations, reduce the welfare state, reduce benefits, but they don't eliminate anything. And the cycle starts up from the beginning over again, and everything starts growing again and growing. And you see this in politics. You see periods where the welfare state grows, and it gets to a point where there's a crisis. And I don't know, uh, Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher get elected, and supposedly they're going to. They make small changes, and things get better. And and then after a few years, after you know, things start growing again and expanding again, and the same cycle being played out over and over and over again. So. Contrast that with capitalism. In capitalism, you have a separation of state from individual. The individuals are responsible for themselves. They, the relationship between individuals and companies is all a relationship of win-win, voluntary, trader-based transactions. There's no zero-sum. There's no exploitation. There's no, I'm benefiting at your expense. And everybody is gaining and it, they're gaining as individuals. And there's no, there's no incentive, there's no reason to form these coercive groups. The only groups you form are voluntary groups, voluntary groups for a purpose. And what is the purpose? A business is a group, right? And the purpose is to create wealth. A purpose is to voluntarily interact in a way that wealth is created that, again, benefits the different participants in it. And it reinforces that if you act, like Greg mentioned, if, if, you're, if you think for yourself, if you, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as Lars mentioned, if you're virtuous, if you act, then you gain, you benefit. And the people around you are trading with you benefit. And that just says to you, these values really work. These virtues, or these, these ideas really work. And you want to do more of it because it's working. And it reinforces itself. And even people like in Lars's organization who, don't, who, who haven't studied the ethics, who didn't study the virtues, they don't know in depth. I mean, we gave them lectures and stuff, and some of them took it more seriously than others. But even the people who didn't take it that seriously, they notice that if they act in this way, it actually is a reinforcing mechanism. So they don't have to be philosophers in order to embrace these ideas because they are working. They're actually producing the results. And again, there are no losers in other than the people who don't do a good job, right? And then it's, but it's not a loss in the sense that it's somebody's gaining at somebody's, at, at, at somebody's expense. So the two systems reinforce each other, and it's one of the, one of the reasons 
that it's so hard to transition from welfare state to capitalism because the welfare state is so m such a reinforcing mechanism. And we've never really had capitalism, right? Ayn Rand's book is called Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal because we don't know it in a sense of the theory and we don't, we've never really implemented fully. And as a consequence, we've never seen that reinforcement. And to the extent that we see it like in America, in spite of all the pressures, it's worked pretty well. I mean, America's in decline, but it survived 200 years because it started off with such a good beginning uh, from that perspective, from that perspective of individualism. Ben? Yeah, thanks, Yaron. I, I wanted to follow up on what you just said by just, uh, I guess, making some recommendations about readings uh, from Ayn Rand that you could, uh, if you're interested in learning more about some of the concepts we've been discussing, uh, follow up on what she thinks about a lot of these kinds of things. And, and the first, I think, to mention is, is just uh, Atlas Shrugged itself, uh, which, uh, a, as your own mentioned, uh, one of the things that it portrays is a, a future society in which uh, advancing statism and, uh, and mixed economy is rapidly uh, deteriorating the economy and the society. And one of the ways that the, that the book is often described, I think, in the popular media is, is as a, uh, single, a singular battle between entrepreneurs and government, uh, where it's a, it's a big government and it's a big oppressive government. And I think that's an oversimplified uh, way of describing what's happening because uh, in, in a deeper way what's being described is that the society is falling apart, it's disintegrating. Uh, yes, there is a big government, but the consequence of the various mixed economy policies that it's pursuing is that it is precisely splitting up society into these different warring pressure groups and interest groups and, and, and various tribes. And so you get a, a very interesting picture of that. And you also get, by contrast, and I can't say too much about this without spoiling the plot, but at a certain stage in the novel you get a portrayal of what the opposite kind of society would look like and the kinds of harmonies of interests that are possible among people uh, when they live as individualists and when they focus on trading value for value. Uh, so that's one point. But then uh, we also should say something about Ayn Rand's nonfiction, uh, of which a lot is being displayed in the back. Uh, one piece that's been mentioned several times today, which is in many ways Ayn Rand's seminal essay on the topic of tribalism is Global Balkanization. Um, that's, in, that's reprinted in this, this book, The Voice of Reason. Uh, we'll probably still, stay, still say more about that later. Um, I also wanted to draw your attention to, I think, an underappreciated essay of hers that touches on the intersection uh, between uh, tribalism and, uh, and the mixed economy in just the way that your own's been describing. Uh, back in uh, 1972, she gave a talk called A Nation's Unity. And for an individualist, you might uh, be surprised to find that Ayn Rand thinks that there's something very important about a nation's unity. But it's, it's, it's for the reason that your own's been mentioning, that she thinks that uh, when, you, when you respect the freedom of another person, you treat them as a rational being, there's a possibility of a harmony of interests and consequently the proper kind of national unity that doesn't involve a society disintegrating into warring tribes. And the connection that Yaron has described uh, whereby the mixed economy pits groups against each other uh, and therefore leads to this kind of tribalism. She has an extended analogy or rather an extended uh, uh, kind of uh, little story that she tells about how this happens. And I, I thought I would just read for you a, a quick passage from this because I think it, uh, it's prescient in a lot of ways. Uh, she describes uh, th uh, a kind of mixed economy situation in which people are uh, setting up little competing groups to compete for uh, various kinds of privileges and welfare benefits and so forth. And she portrays the situation of a, uh, uh, somebody who doesn't fall into any of the ordinary interest groups. Uh, they're not uh, Afro-American, Chicano-American, Italo-American, Jewish-American, Irish-American. She says, you, you are just a mongrel American, a title of which you have been proud at one time, but which is becoming dangerous. If you lose your, your job, there will be no preferential quota to help you get another, and no way of knowing how many ethnic applicants will be pushed ahead of you. There will be no preferential quota for your son's admission to college when the time comes. And then skipping a little further, uh, she talks about how uh, this kind of person sort of left out by the system 
When you hear a CD lecturer at a group meeting declare the Horatio Alger stories are a myth, that a man cannot rise by individual effort and ability, you applaud defiantly and belligerently. You do not know exactly what they stand for, but they talk of community action and mutual protection, and they denounce other groups. You do not know clearly which ones or why. And she goes on to say, uh, one day you discover that what you feel for men is hatred. So she's describing, the, I mean, there's, there's the obvious way in which people are pitted against each other in terms of these uh, kind of ethnic interest groups, but then the ones who are left out suddenly see themselves uh, on the outs as well and start to form their own little identity politics group. And I think that we're seeing uh, a lot of that uh, in, in the various forms of kind of right-wing, uh, white nationalist uh, rhetoric happening uh, in both Europe and America today. Uh, and this, uh, unfortunately, is not reprinted in any of her major collections, but you can listen to the audio of it on Ayn Rand campus. And uh, uh, Ankar Gatte and I also did a little webinar about this uh, that you can find on the YouTube channel uh, for the Ayn Rand Institute. So uh, let me uh, let me stay on track with sort of the practical implementation here, because in contrary to you two guys, I actually grew up in a Scandinavian welfare society, uh, and I just want to give a little warning here also how quickly this can happen, right? Because in 1960, which was three years before I was born, Denmark was uh, had a, a total tax pressure of 25 percent of GDP. It's the same as Switzerland that had a total tax pressure of 25% of GDP, and it was uh, uh, less than the U.S. that had a 28%, uh, and considerably less than the U.K. that had 33% uh, total tax pressure on GDP. 20 years later, in 1980, Denmark had a, an overall tax pressure in excess of 50%, uh, and uh, the other guys had kind of Increased a little bit, but 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 nowhere near as dramatic as that. So in 20 years, we went from being one of the most liberal, one of the most uh, low taxation countries in the world, really, uh, in, in the developed world, uh, to being the most uh, heavily taxed country in, in the free world. Uh, and what drove that? Well, well, somebody in 1957 got the great idea of introducing a universal benefit which was a pension. Before that, uh, some people would get pensions and other people would save up themselves. But in 1957, for the first time, one decided that everybody should have a pension, whether they needed it or not, uh, whether they wanted it or not. Uh, and then that led to a whole range of, of other universal offerings that, that a lot of people uh, had, had thrown at them without really asking about them. Uh, and that led to a rapid deterioration in, in, in responsibility for your own life. Uh, I say, if you go back to the 20s or the 30s, you know, even very left-wing uh, working-class people were very, very reluctant to go down to, to the public local office to ask for help for their families. It was a matter of pride for them to, to care for their own families, to be able to put food on the table, to, to not really be... Uh, be a burden on, on anyone. Um, of course, uh, they were very left-wing. They, they would complain about the capitalist and the terrible conditions on the factories, but they would take a personal pride in, in actually uh, fending for themselves and their families, uh, even, even in tough times. Whereas today, I think, uh, because of, 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 of this change, you know, today it's completely uncontroversial to, to simply abuse that system and, 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 and take a lot of payments from the public sector because you you prefer to pursue your artistic career, that nobody wants to buy your paintings, it's not really your problem, but uh, so you take the government's money, or you prefer to study a number of university studies without really finishing any of them, and, and uh, you know, you want to find the right place in life, and, and, uh, and if you do want to study anthropology or, or Eskimos or something, it's not your problem that, that there's not enough jobs for people that are expert in Eskimos, right? And this, um, this, this, this is just a very significant shift in values, which, uh, which in our country has led to now. Uh, uh, it's a small country; we got 5.6 million inhabitants there, uh, and it has led to a fact that that uh, out of the labor workforce, uh, uh, out of the four million uh, grown-up labor workforce, uh, taking out the kids and the pensioners, 800,000 are on some kind of of, of 
pre-pension because they can't work because of this or they can't work because of that mental or physical problem and, and you have an enormous industry uh, catering for people and convincing them that they are victims of society and hence they, they shouldn't have to work. Then we have a, a public sector with, with another eight, nine hundred thousand employees uh, that, that are there and, and, and then there's a remaining 2.2 uh, million people that work in the private sector. So it's nearly 50-50 between the private sector and people that are either working in the public sector, which you know I is completely uh, legitimate in, in, in many contexts, but but uh, but still having to rely on the 2.2 million actually creating the wealth that can be taxed and and, and distributed. If you add to that, then of course pensioners that uh, that that is yet another million. Uh, you have the situation in in my country that two thirds of of the population is almost entirely dependent on the government for payouts, right? And, and one-third uh, is in the private sector uh, approximately trying to, to fend and, and pay for, for all this, right? So this is very much the, you know, the joke about the two wolves and a sheep uh, voting about uh, who should be eaten for lunch. Um, the sheep is in a pretty poor con condition in that particular bed. And, and if you tell people both that they can vote their way to other people's money, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, even if you could potentially sustain yourself without other people's money, then you're in a pretty bad place, maybe even an, an irreversible place, I, I fear, because uh, what that then leads to uh, is that you cannot really get elected to prime minister without, uh, without catering for this large, uh, large contingent of people dependent on the government. So you have no chance of, of being elected with a sort of a liberalistic point of view or, or cutting expenses in the, in the public sector or reducing taxes, that is just not the road to, to being in government or being prime minister in, in a country like that. And that actually means that today, I would say seven out of the eight, nine parties we sort of have going in and out of parliament, uh, seven out of them are really all social democratic parties. It's very, very difficult to tell the difference between them. Uh, they, they, they almost think the same thing, so there is no alternative to this welfare state. I, I personally uh, was a little bit involved in, in the one party that tried to challenge this, and, uh, and while we're quite happy going from zero to 7.5% of the population, there's still a long, long way before we, we uh, get a chance to implement any sort of significant public sector reform and, 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 and lower taxation. So, so once you get to that point, it's very, very hard to reverse. On a positive note, though, I would say it also seems like it tends to stop at a certain level. It hasn't actually gotten an awful lot worse in, in monetary terms. There's a lot more you know, involvement and interference in your private life and, 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 and all that. But, but the tax pressure, if anything, is possibly a little bit lower today, probably in the late 40s. And, and particularly our neighbor country, Sweden, has done quite significant reforms uh, that have, have reduced their tax overall tax pressure by three or four percentage points. So it does seem as if... There is a point where you begin to be able to tell people uh, that, that it just doesn't work to tax anymore and, and, and maybe one of the problems could be inefficiencies rather than lack of money in the public sector. Right? You have to think also OECD has pretty clearly identified uh, that, that the efficiency of money used in the public sector is approximately 60% on average of the money uh, deployed in the private sector. So if you give half of your economy to the, to the public sector and they then are 60% as efficient, I mean, you're throwing away a pretty big chunk of your GDP uh, compared to what it could have been, right? Apart from all the negative dynamic effects. So just to round off, then I also tried to live in a place that is European, but actually has a slightly more rational approach to things, i.e. Switzerland, where I moved uh, about nine years ago, and, and where you have uh, today a tax pressure of about 30% overall, so it's also gone up a little bit since the 60s, but but where you have a public sector, as far as I know, of about half a million, uh, so considerably less than in Denmark, and a, and a significantly bigger population of about 8 million, I would say. Uh, we were 5.6 in Denmark. And also, what is quite amazing, uh, everything actually works. You know, if you, if, you, if you have a need for something from the public sector, it actually works. You know, if you, if you need somebody to assist you, you instantly get a time at the hospital, or if you throw away a piece of paper and you call the police station to get a new copy, they actually drive up to your front gate and deliver it to you rather than you having to queue up for, for four or six hours, right? So, uh, so that's an interesting, not that I'm endorsing it, but I would say that's a 
closest thing we get to the Gulfs in Europe, at least, right? The, so, uh, and the really interesting thing is actually one of the reasons it works quite well there is that they collect nearly as much tax per inhabitant as you do in Denmark, but the overall the overall wealth level, because you have much more better dynamics, is actually that people uh, produce much more, uh, keep much more for themselves, and and in essence, all the positive effects uh, mean that 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 you have an altogether much 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 better well-functioning society. You got the best health rates. Uh, the some of the old, eldest oldest people uh, survive to very old. You have half the crime of what you have in most other European countries. You have some of the world's leading universities there. You have some of the world's biggest uh, uh, corporate uh, HQs there. So, so it's a really good example of how you can balance the two things without going sort of overboard in, in either direction. And the final note is it's very direct democracy. I, even in my little village, uh, and they are very small, the villages in Switzerland, there's uh, 2,600 or 2,800 Gemeindes, little uh, local authorities. So that means an average of a few thousand people in each of them. That means you know the mayor. You can meet him in the street sometimes. If you're unhappy, you can tell him, uh, and people do. Uh, if you want to vote about something he's proposed, you have to collect 5% of the voters in that particular uh, local authority, which in would be 100, 200 signatures, and you get a full vote on, on quite significant issues. And if you win it, unless it's something that's dictated by Bern, which in which case you wouldn't get the vote, but you can do the same on national level. So you have very direct democracy, very direct accountability, which is probably why things are, are kept uh, better under control there than, than most European countries. You could say it's the exact opposite of the EU, where you concentrate big power, but so far away from the electorate and the people that actually are affected by it that uh, there's near zero accountability between the leadership of Europe and and the man on the street in any, any given European country. So. So if, if there is a model here that can work and sort of encompass both sides, I think Switzerland is a, is a better, better bet than most. All right, we're going to take, uh, take questions. So uh, from any of the sections or if, uh, if, you're, if you have any, pretty much on anything. So feel free. But I thought the Danes are like the happiest people in the world. Well, actually, we lost that position. I think. Oh, you did. I think the Swiss are now the, the happiest Swiss, in the world. Okay. But that, I also moved down there, of course. So maybe. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> see, you you tilted. Uh, <laughs> but we're still uh, we're still very happy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit uh, difficult to understand, but but uh, because we also have a lot of unhappiness, yep. very yeah. a lot of, of of pills and drugs and depression stuff, and so there's some something not quite adding up there, but. Uh, but at the end of the day, Denmark is a fairly happy society. But the interesting thing is that it seems to be that Scandinavians are of a relatively optimistic disposition. You can, you can track groups of Scandinavians yeah. that went yeah. to the US 100, 150 years ago, and they're well above average happy people there, also without the welfare state, yeah. amazingly, right? <laughs> um, I hope it's ap appropriate uh, to ask a very fundamental question uh, to the concept objectivism. Um, there is um, another objectivist organization, the Atlas Society, and I think there are much others, and they all call themselves objectivists. And for me personally, um, is the problem if I question the tenets of objectivism and examine it and come to the conclusion that there are some faults in it. Uh, is it proper for me to call me objectivist? Or what is the... I mean, I, I, I think the answer is yes, there's a problem. I mean, you might be right. Objectivism does not equal truth. And, uh, you know, it's important in, in this, particularly with you guys, you know, you might discover that you disagree with an aspect of it. You might think that you have a better definition or a better idea about a certain aspect of objectivism. But it's not objectivism. That is, what's clear is that Ayn Rand defined her philosophy. Uh, to me, this is an, an intellectual property rights issue. She said, my philosophy is everything I wrote, and it's called objectivism. If, if you then make further developments, you want to change stuff, you want to, then it's something else. It's you, or come up with a name. 
But objectivism is what Ayn Rand wrote and a few of the authorized stuff that she authorized. That, that's just what she wanted. That, that was the, her request. And I think we should honor that request. I think, I think it's, it's an issue of integrity to honor the request of a creator on how to address her ideas. And if, again, if you think you found errors, if you think you've got expansions or new virtues or, or whatever, um, then call it what it is, your, understand, your, you know, your ideas. Um, or come up with a new name for it. But it's, it's not objectives. I'll add something to that, which connects, I think, to something that came up at the very beginning of the conference that uh, Tal raised. Um, that, uh, so there is this philosophy called objectivism. It's Ayn Rand's philosophy. I agree with what your own says about that. There are some people out there who, because they disagree with one element or another of the philosophy, will, will sometimes say that they are offering a new and improved version of objectivism. And I, I disagree with that for the reason that your own said. Objectivism is what it is. But sometimes uh, I think that the motive for wanting to do that is because uh, the people in question would very much like to have a tribe that they're a member of. And they want to say that they're a member of the objectivist tribe, even if they happen to disagree with part of it, but they, st they don't know of any other tribe to belong to. And, and so this is why what Tal said at the beginning was very important, that, that one not think of this philosophy that way, and that when one comes to a conference like this, uh, one's interested in finding out what, well, here Ayn Rand has some ideas. I want to find out what they are. Uh, I want to see if I agree with them or not. I might agree with some of them. I might not agree with others. I might learn something either way, whether I end up agreeing with some of it or all of it. And connecting to the broader theme of the value of individualism, what, what, what's important about being an individualist is not which tribe you associate with or whether you call yourself an objectivist. Uh, it's, it's whether you care about the truth. And you, you may decide objectivism is true, you may not, but if what you're concerned with is figuring out what's true in the world, uh, that's, that's the most important thing, and it shouldn't matter so much you know, what label uh, you want to call yourself. And for that reason, it's bizarre that some people want to appropriate a label just so they can expand the boundaries of the tribe arbitrarily. So, a thing that I face, I mean, I, I, I can take the example of me talking to my mother and telling her what ideas I have if I go to a conference like this, what, what is that about? And what comes back is, yeah, but without a welfare state, I couldn't put food on the table, you couldn't go to university, so... You know, that's just dreams. How does one answer that? I, I struggle. <laughs> I mean, it's just not true. I know. Um, <laughs> How and, and, say and you have to point out that it's just not true. It's 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 wrong. And the contrary. I mean, this is and this is what I think is lost in the debate. On the contrary, without a welfare state, we're all richer. On a welfare state, there's more food on the table. Without a welfare state. There's more production, there's more wealth, there's more, you know, good stuff out there for us to consume and produce and create, more opportunities, more variety of jobs, more spiritual values. And, 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 and if, you look, if you look at what life was before capitalism and if you look at what life is with capitalism and if you look at what life is in the more capitalist countries versus the more, one less capital, you can see hints of that already. Um, but it's not, it, it, it's, it's exact opposite of how people think of it. It, it, it. You know, and one way to illustrate that is every dollar of welfare has to be produced by somebody. That is, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a zero, it's a zero sum. And instead of that dollar going into producing more, so there's more stuff, if you will, it's going to redistributing and end up, so the, I hate the pie analogy. The, the economy or whatever it is is not growing. It's just being, stuff is being redistributed across it. Uh, so it's, it's the exact reverse of that. And, and look, it's very hard to argue with mothers. And I generally, 
With this having had a lot of experience <laughs> at doing this, I don't recommend it. It doesn't get you anywhere. <laughs> you almost never succeed, and it just creates family angst. And just give up on it. Your mother's your mother. She is what she is. You're not going to change her. Focus on young people. Focus on young people who are who are more capable of change. But I would say um, it, it's a it's a very relevant question also because again, if you're in a fully fully committed welfare state like like some of the Scandinavians, certainly Denmark, um, the, the welfare state also protects itself from from actually being put to the test. Right? Uh, for example, in Denmark, you cannot uh, make a school for profit. You know, so so you, you cannot build a school where you where you uh, where you actually make money on it, which obviously keeps people's incentive to try to, to make a more efficient school or a place where people might uh, get better graduations, etc. Uh, that, that there's not a strong incentive. You can actually make free schools, you're just not allowed to make money on them. So you can make a free school where the government has to pay, I think, 75% of the cost, and you can contribute the last 25%, and you can change the curriculum a little bit, but you're not allowed to make money on it. Another example is the health sector. There are a very, very few uh, uh, private hospitals in Denmark. They are certainly not the, something you make life very easy for, but because of the uh, inefficiency of the public sector health uh, uh, service, they cannot keep any longer to many of the promises they made about how long time you have to wait for a hip operation or a broken this or broken that. And, and therefore, they actually occasionally outsource now to bring down these very long, sometimes year-long waiting lists uh, by outsourcing a little bit to the private hospitals that then delivers, for example, a hip operation at a approximately half the price of, of, of what it does in the, in the public sector, right? But it's, it's very hard and, and very difficult to ex even get to challenge that point of view that the, that the, that the welfare state delivers uh, everything for you, right? And, and I'm just again warning that once, once it's really fully integrated, it gets harder and harder rather than the other way around. I mean, today, if you, even the even the smallest thing you, you bring up, why don't we try to outsource this little service or that little service, you'll meet a massive, uh, massive uh, resistance because people say, oh, but it could, it could go wrong, or what if they didn't do it well? Or, and the fact is, so much, so much, so much stuff goes wrong in the public sector, right? That, uh, you know, it, that doesn't actually solve the problem. But, but you just got to be aware that, that uh, your mom will, will, will probably never, never see her, her assumption challenged because the, the welfare state will protect itself from, from uh, being exposed as, uh, as a pretty inefficient way of doing things. I, I just want... Oh, go ahead. Well, I just want to add one thing, going back to what Lars said in his previous comments, about that in the 1920s and 30s, a worker would put food on the table and feed the, feel the pride and the satisfaction of knowing that he took care of, of, of feeding himself and feeding his family and taking care of his life, and that the welfare state denies him the ability to have that pride. And in many respects, the psychological damage, the damage to self-esteem, the damage to the pride of the individual is, is maybe the most damaging thing. So the welfare state hurts the people who get the welfare. It's damaging to the recipients in addition to damaging the people whose money is taken. And I think that's an interesting case that I don't think we make enough of. And it's a case that we can take to the recipients, right, to convince them that the welfare state is not in their interest. Interest. And there's a lot of good stuff in uh, your own book with Don Watkins on this topic, the equal, the equal is unfair book. But just I wanted to make a quick comment about rhetorical strategy for individualists in cases of political disagreement, uh, not just with one, one's mother, but father and friends and peers, generally speaking. And that is, and, and not to say that this is your issue, but uh, you often get a lot of questions like this at sessions like this where someone says, I have an argument with so-and-so, what do I say to answer them about this? And uh, I think it's important at first to keep in mind that there's on any kind of controversial political topic there's never any one thing you can say to change somebody's mind about anything uh, there's almost never anything even very extended or discourse length that you can say to change their mind about anything and it's important to be at peace about that especially if you're an individualist who shouldn't care about the fact that people disagree with uh, you just for that very reason uh, and so it 
approach your communication with people with that in mind. I'm not going to change their mind, but maybe we can each learn something from each other in having a conversation about this question and ask them what their reasons for thinking this are. Ask them why they think that they can't survive without a welfare state when people were able to do it you know, 100 years ago or whatever. And maybe you'll find out that there's a, a, a moral premise at work in the way they evaluate the facts of the last hundred years, and then you can have a conversation about that. But uh, mind changing is, not, is something that happens only over the very long term, uh, especially if the other people are themselves rational and have to take time to think things over. So um, I've asked uh, the questioners uh, to be brief, we'll and I'm to gonna ask you guys to do <laughs> the same. Thanks. Uh, about uh, individualism and uh, the welfare state, uh, in Europe we have something that you don't have in America, the huge burden of history. How can you convince people in Europe to get rid of the welfare, welfare state and to adopt American value, uh, values when for them, it, for them it means uh, losing their uh, identity, their singularity, cutting with, with their prestigious history and become only a copy of the dominant country? So I don't view, I don't know if this is on, is this on? Now it's on. I don't view what we ask him to do is to uh, adopt America, right? It's to adopt individualism. Individualism that was advocated for by Enlightenment thinkers here in Europe. Not that it matters, it could have been on the moon. Who cares where good ideas come from, right? You wanna, f you wanna pursue good ideas. You wanna pursue life enhancing ideas. And the idea, I mean, this is exactly the kind of tribalism that Europeans have. Uh, we're historically collectivists, so we're going to stay collectivist even if it makes us poor, uh, or even if it makes us unhappy, or even if it destroys our lives. I mean, that's exactly the kind of attitude that we're combating. So it's not copy America. It's be an individualist. That is, for your own life, as an individual. And again, I'm not, we're not trying to say France become... I thought I heard a French accent. France become capitalist. It's much more... You as an individual, take your life seriously, live as an individualist, and if enough people do that, I truly believe that the only alternative that they will ever want is freedom. Because what does it mean to be an individualist if then you can't make choices? If then your choices are constrained by force, by, by government, right? So you want the freedom to make those choices. So I, I think it's wrong to think of it as American, and therefore foreign, it's tribal to think in that in terms. What are the right ideas? What are the true ideas? What are the ideas that will help me and help the people I love and care about live the best life that we can live? Hi. Mm, do you think there is a relationship between Friedrich Nietzsche philosophy and objectivism? And if, it, if there isn't a relationship, what do you think of Nietzsche? <laughs> it's a broad question, I know. <laughs> well, so there's, there's at least a, uh, some historical relationship in that we know that Ayn Rand read Nietzsche. She was heavily influenced by Nietzsche, especially in her younger days. Uh, and you, you see even um, the marks of his influence appearing as late as uh, The Fountainhead, uh, though she subsequently, I believe, edited out some of those uh, references. Uh, there was a quote she was going to affix at one point, but... Um, the way that she described her mature perspective on Nietzsche, if I recall correctly, was that uh, because of the way in which he, uh, I mean, he's famous as a critic of Judeo-Christian altruism and the morality of self-sacrifice. Uh, and that, and he even has, she says, very poetic ways of expressing th this this op an opposition to that viewpoint, uh, at times which even sound somewhat individualistic. Uh, but what she realized in, uh, as, she, as she grew as an intellectual was that uh, Nietzsche's individualism, quote unquote, uh, is, was a really kind of a, a pseudo-individualism -indi insofar as it wasn't informed by the kinds of ideas that you saw discussed earlier today in Dr. Gatte's lecture, Dr. Salmieri's lecture, where what matters to an individualist is seeking out the truth uh, and seeking out the objective truth. Uh, because for Nietzsche, uh, 
it's, it's a long story, but uh, he, he's a kind of irrationalist who thinks that there really isn't an objective truth to know, and so it's not worth trying to know. And he's also uh, a determinist. He thinks we're all pushed around by a force called the will to power, uh, which sounds at first like it's free will, but it's not free will. Uh, and I'll be talking more about uh, the connection between free will and individualism tomorrow. Uh, so uh, there are superficial resemblances between uh, Nietzsche and Rand and some you know, actual historical influence, but at the end of the day, uh, she's fundamentally a critic of the, the basic uh, principles of his philosophy and uh, Nietzsche has been influential today a lot on, I think, especially the, the kind of alt-right. Uh, some of Nikos was talking about uh, some of this influence earlier today when he talked about the romantic anti-capitalist viewpoint. A lot of that is coming out of Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche had a tremendous amount of influence on uh, postmodernist thinkers, and uh, that's feeding into various forms of identity politics today. Thank you. Hello, my name is Özgür. Uh, I would like to ask that uh, as we listen that the Denmark has a huge uh, tax burden on business and also we know that France have huge regulative uh, burden on business and when Macron tried to challenge that, we also saw that what happened with the Yellow West protests. My question is this, why Atlas is not shrugged in those societies? Uh, I, I don't want to speak for France, but uh, but I'll speak for Denmark, and I would say there are redeeming factors in Denmark. Let me hasten to add that. I mean, we have uh, we have a very well functioning labour market, a uh, very flexible labour market, far better than what uh, you know in, in in France or Germany, where once you hire somebody, you you nearly might as well have married them because you're going to be <laughs> be stuck with them for a long time, right? Uh, where Denmark, you have uh, the the payoff between having fairly generous social uh, support to people that are, are, are unemployed is also that it's relatively easy to lay off people if, if you suffer a downturn in your business, etc. And I would say uh, that there are absolutely redeeming factors in, in, in Denmark seen from a business point of view. I mean, I, I ran uh, Saxo Bank uh, out, of, out of Denmark. Our headquarters have been there. Um, it's possible there are other countries that, that would have been easier to do it, but, but it's certainly possible, and there's a number of very successful businesses having been built over the years. Uh, there is kind of a, a, a devious understanding, I think, among politicians that you can only squeeze the lemon that much before, uh, before uh, the juice sort of stops <coughs> flowing, right? And, and actually, uh, actually, our former finance minister, Social Democrat, many years ago, proposed some really heavy increases to company taxation, etc. And it was questioned, you know, wouldn't all the capitalists just leave? And, and, and his comment was that they had calculated very accurately that this, this was not enough to make the capitalists leave, right? So, uh, so they do think about not, not squeezing the lemon too hard. There's a little bit of a new narrative that I don't like very much, that, that although Denmark, by measure of the Gini, the coefficient, for example, is a very equal society that's now spreading this narrative that it's a very unequal society. It was pretty ridiculous when we are one of the most equal uh, societies in the world. But, but uh, by and large, uh, there's a certain rationality to not overdo things. And, uh, and there's a, a very strong IT infrastructure. You know, we're probably the most digital country in the world, which, which is, is convenient for, for modern modern business models, uh, so, so, you know, it's not all bad, and, and, and that's important to add, because I always get a lot of stick when I've been out abroad saying something negative at Denmark, they get very angry with me. So, so uh, that, I mean, I, 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 I own also stakes in uh, multiple businesses in Denmark, so it's by no means an impossible place to do uh, business, and, and I would probably prefer that to France, to be honest, but, but I'm not knowledgeable enough to say that in a 100% fair way. But, but it, you should also add that Atlas is shrugging. You left Denmark, and and I remember, I remember being at a at a board at a at an advisory board meeting, of one of your investment companies, and there was a a, a number of very successful Danish entrepreneurs, um, who were advisors who were there. <laughs> and at some point, I think, uh, the question we went through and introduced ourselves, and every single one of the Danish, the ones who were successful entrepreneurs, every single one of them left lived, either in London or in Switzerland. Not a single one of them lived actually in Denmark. So to some extent, of course, they're shrugging. 
Hello, uh, I'd like to ask the question or maybe your opinion on the matter of globalism and welfare state because there are studies that show that even if the overall welfare of society increases thanks to the free trade and globalism, uh, there is a, the poor part of the society gets worse than the richest part because of the low uh, skilled labor. <coughs> so they are actually harmed by the globalism. And even from an economical point of view, this shouldn't cause a problem because overall the welfare increases but nevertheless creates higher inequality and that creates social tensions and that's why we have populism and Donald Trump. So how, what, what is your recipe to alleviate the social tensions coming from increased inequality? So, you know, I don't have a full time to answer the question fully. So I, I encourage you to look up on the, online my, my talks on Equal is Unfair or, or my book Equal is Unfair. But, but let me just say this first, yeah, I mean, competition will drive some wages down in the short run, and but that's life, right? And, and if people could do something better, then then you better you better take responsibility for your own life. This goes back to individualism. Take responsibility for your own life. Figure out what you need to do to become more productive, so that you can earn more money. And don't think of yourself as one of the working class or one of the poor. You are you. And your responsibility is to you, and you have to compete for a job. We all have to compete for jobs, and we have to be as good as we can be, and we have to think ahead, will robots take my job, and how can I ad adjust and adapt, and, and so on. So part of being an individualist is owning the, your life, which means owning the risk and taking responsibility for that risk and taking responsibility for the future, the rewards and the, and, and the challenges. So... I don't like part of the tribalism is the macro, these macro numbers. The poor do this and the rich do this and the middle class go there. I don't know any middle class or poor. I know you and you and you and I know individuals. And some are doing very well and some are not doing that well. And the question is why? And, and at the end of the day, freedom is the solution for those people who are willing to take full responsibility over themselves and, and succeed. I think the social unrest caused by inequality is primarily social unrest caused by people talking about inequality. I, there was no, I, 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 the social unrest that we're seeing right now is really a phenomena of, over the last particularly 10 years, of everybody writing that this is a bad thing, that this is awful, that you should be upset, that you should be worried, and nobody emphasizing all the good things, for example, that are happening, that a poor person in, in Denmark, a poor person in the United States, a poor person almost anywhere in the Western world has an iPhone, I mean, I don't know how, how valuable is that to one's life, and but you can't measure that. Economists can't put a number on it. So I can, I can put a number. Yeah. You want to hear it? Yeah. Because I think it's there's so much false information yeah. and yeah. propaganda in this yeah. inequality debate, right? First of all, you you normally you split people up in like uh, ten percent, twenty percent decent tiles of, of, of wealth, right? But, and then you look, oh, the, the, the lowest 10% haven't increased their wages the last 10 years. It's totally untrue. It's yep. a totally new group of people that are down there. In fact, if you look at the specific individuals, how they move from group to group, the people that had by far the largest increase in, in salaries in the past 10 years will almost uh, invariably be the people in the lowest 10% because it's not the same people. That is typically students are temporarily unemployed. That is that group. So if you look at those numbers, uh, you'll find actually that they're upwardly mobile to an extreme degree. And you'll also find in the top 10% richest, actually, a hell of a lot of those guys drop out because they had a good year where they, their business was running very well or whatever. So there's an enormous mobility inside these static pictures that we get shown. That's one thing. But the one thing I want to say about the iPhone, because yeah. you're always talking about yeah. the iPhone, right? There's actually a meme circulating on Facebook at the moment where somebody said, in 1985, I could actually, if I bought enough machines, I could have functionality that approximated what's in an iPhone, yeah. right? You could buy a fax machine, you could buy <laughs> a, f a, a photo machine, you could buy a very fancy mainframe computer, etc. But it would take up pr pretty much the size of your hotel room, and it would cost you approximately $35 million in those days, right? But then you would have more or less the same functionality as you have in an iPhone today. So it was possible to uh, estimate the value. And, and this is the other thing we're forgetting in this debate. Maybe your nominal amount is not going up so much, but what do you get in return? Yeah, you know, exactly. this thing. I mean, this thing that Yaron always shows. 
this would have cost you 35 million bucks in 1985. Now, now anybody nearly, I'll say, even if you're in the poor group in, in Western Europe, you, you, you normally have an iPhone, right? You live longer, you don't die from diseases, you died off in the 70s, you have enormous access to entertainment on the same iPhone, and so think about what you get for the money, and I, it's, just, it's just a completely false premise for this whole inequality discussion. Uh, there's lots of mobility, you get lots more for your money. In fact, I would say, the billionaire, he could still have spent 35 million bucks and, and, and got that back in the day, a little bit impractical and not easy to carry around, but he could have done it. So who has the most benefit of that? Clearly the person that doesn't have 35 million bucks, right? I just want to say something really quickly about the term globalism, which you used to ask the question. Uh, so one of, one of the ways in which Ayn Rand uh, recommended we all be individualists in our thinking about the world is to not uh, accept uncritically concepts that we hear tossed about uh, in public discourse. And, and, and she thought that there, were cer there was a certain kind of concept which uh, she called it a package deal, where uh, it, would, it would group things together that, were, that had a certain superficial similarity between the two of them, but they were still deep down very different. And I think that globalism is one of these package deals that she would have criticized. It, it, it groups together, on the one hand, uh, international free trade, which for reasons we've discussed today, and uh, individualists should be uh, pretty happy about. But then also a whole elaborate set of uh, global governmental organizations and institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, the UN, uh, which in fact does cause all kinds of uh, economic dislocations around the world. And the, the, the effect of the term globalism, the way that it's usually used, is to end up impugning the benefits of free trade by uh, guilt by association with, with the detriments of uh, these global governmental organizations. And uh, I, I urge people not to use that term globalism. Talk about international free trade, talk about international governmental organizations, but those are very different things, even though they both happen to be something that happens around the world. And that's just a superficial similarity. Thank you. So for the last uh, questions, we have one minute for each. Otherwise, we need to eliminate some of them. Can an objectivist be religious while maintaining the coherence of his beliefs? And how many people do you guys personally know who are both religious and objectivist? I don't know if I can do this in a minute, but uh, I don't think anyone, let alone objectivists, uh, can maintain coherent beliefs uh, while being religious. Now that's a controversial statement which I can't explain in 48 seconds, uh, but it it has a lot to do, in Ayn Rand's view, uh, with the fact that, uh, first of all, I mean, what are your grounds for believing in uh, religious figures or entities? Uh, a lot of people don't have evidence for their beliefs. And at that point, you've already you know, kicked out concern with coherence or evidence or rationality. Now, there are people who give arguments uh, for a belief in God. Uh, and we could have a conversation about whether those arguments work. Uh, and whether they end up being consistent with the deepest premises of a rational philosophy. Um, but that is, a, that is a longer story and uh, somewhat off topic, but you know, we, we can talk about it offline. I don't know if anybody wanted to add anything on it over here. Three seconds left. <laughs> I've been inspired by uh, biographies of uh, American industrialists, especially that uh, for many of them, it was actually true that they accomplished a lot, even in their 18s. Uh, that really inspired me. And um, what I'm observing right now is the age at which people are, you know, supposed to be mature and adults keeps going up, like 25 and over. And um, I think there is something really good for appreciating freedom when, you know, you uh, create something really big with your mind. Uh, in uh, you know in, in your teen, for example, right, as opposed to being in class or turning to activism. Uh, so, what what are your thoughts? Uh, what can we do uh, to actually you know um, spend our young uh, years uh, most productively? So, what can you do to spend you, in terms of your? I mean, become an individualist, right? I mean, I really figure out what your values really are. Use your mind to, to engage with reality, to figure out 
what kind of life you want to live and how to live it. Uh, I, I think, I think being young is a great up is the opportunity because you're setting the foundation for the rest of your life. Try to you know try to really educate yourself. Try to really study. Try to really figure out what's true and what's not, what's right and what's wrong. What kind of life you want to live and what kind of life you want to plan for the future. And I think there are a lot of 18-year-olds and 20-year-olds that are doing a lot in business today. I think people actually start far, far earlier oh, yeah. than, than, than they used to do. And they know they always uh, succeed, but they get some experience. And so I think actually young people are early starters in, in, in business, right? And you should never underestimate the value of being young. I mean, I would give you every cent in the bank to be 20 again uh, if I had the chance. So, you know, be happy that you're young and make the most of it. And it's important as I th think it was uh, Ankar who stressed earlier today, that individualists aren't atomists. They're not people who just isolate themselves from the rest of the world. And so one thing that a young person who's still an individualist can be looking for in the world is uh, people to admire, people to look up to, heroes. Ayn Rand had a, had, you know, a lot to say about the concept of hero worship. And uh, y there's a lot to learn about what you might do with your life someday by looking around for people to emulate. And that's a good plug for the mentorship uh, speed mentoring session that's going to be happening in just a few minutes, where you can talk to some of those people, maybe. Thank you. Hello. I would like to ask you um, about the relationship between uh, objectivism and mental well-being, uh, specifically um, in light of raising, uh, rising statistics about depression, anxiety, uh, suicide, uh, as well as specifically concerning people who simply can't take responsibility for their own lives and can't function like others in uh, the Western society. Thank you. I, mean, I think there's a huge relationship between the growth of the welfare state, uh, the growth of tribalism, uh, the, the undercutting of, as Ankar described this morning, the undercutting of reason, the, the irrationalism in the world with the rise of of mental health issues, right? Now, I don't, I, we have to be careful about the rise of mental health issues statistically because we measure mental health today very differently than we did 50 years ago. So it's not clear exactly what's happening. But okay, let's accept that it's rising. You can see that if you teach people that their mind is impotent, if you teach people that reason cannot lead to the truth, then what do I do, right? Then, then what is left? And, and, and it drives reliance and emotion, it drives much more failure, failure in relationships between human beings, failure in careers, failure in other things, which leads to depression, which you can see leads to other mental health problems. So I, I think that, the, that again, committing oneself to one's own mind, to the efficacy of one's own mind, to, the, to one's own life, it, you know, if we could get that as a cultural movement, I think it would change the, the, the extent to which mental health issues are a problem to a large extent. Thank you. Yep. Hi, my name is Shaval. I'm from Israel, and my question is directed to Yaron Brook. You talked a lot about how America is um, a country that uh, was built on the, on the uh, ideas of individualism, and that's the reason that it thrived and succeeded so much. And you and me both know that Israel is a very tribal place. You also said that in your uh, talk earlier. So just as you can give an example of America being an individualistic country and succeeding, I can give an example of Israel being a tribal uh, country and succeeding just as much, if not better. Well, that's a strong statement, <laughs> a very strong statement, uh, which I don't think is true. Um, I think Israel has this, uh, it's, like, it's like a lot of countries, it's a mixed economy, it's a mixed world. Um, I, I think it's got some deep tribal roots and it's got a real deep tribal nature to its culture. But at the same time, um, it, it, in certain realms of life, it really does cultivate individualism and I think, I think the I think it, it, uh, it cultivates it in many different ways, but I'd say one of the reasons, and here's just a theory, right? One of the reasons I think Jews are overwhelmingly represented in intellectual fields is that one of the things that Israel and, and, and Judaism, in a sense, allows for is robust debate and discussion. We disagree all the time, right, as a culture. 
you know, it, it, it's, and we argue. And dinner table conversation in a Jewish household, particularly in Israel, is about yelling at one another. I mean, having these robust conversations. But it really is about, you know, you having your own thoughts. You're never expected to just shut up and, and listen. In, in, in. So in that sense, while definitely there's a tribal nature, there's also an individualistic part of it. One cannot even imagine how well Israel would do and how great Israel could be if that individualistic part was more emphasized. I'll give you just one. I mean, look at the history of Israel. I grew up in Israel when it was much more tribal, much more socialist, much more collectivist than it is today. And it was poor. It won wars, but it was poor. And since it's shifted a little bit, not a huge amount, but at least in politics, it shifted away from socialism to more individual responsibility, more you know, uh, uh, innovation, more encouraging of entrepreneurs, you know, lower taxes, lower regulations, all of that, it's become much richer. The more you emphasize the individualistic aspects of the society, the better as an economy it will do. But then you can conclude that the best option is a, a mixture of both tribalism and... No, I, I don't think you can because, and this is what people say about socialism too, look, all, the, all these mixed economies like Switzerland and Denmark, and they do fine, right? They're doing great. And, and they do great to the extent that they have freedom, to the extent that they have capitalism. Israel does great to the extent that it encourages individualism. And the more you encourage, and, and you can see this over time, the more you encourage these certain ideas, the better you do. And the more you encourage the alternative ideas, the worse you do. So it's like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spectrum on which you're moving. The more you move towards, and just take economics for a second, the more you move towards capitalism, the richer, more prosperous, more successful economically you do. The further away you move, and yeah, in the middle there's this mixture and economies bounce around, and it's not bad in the middle. That's one of the challenges we have in getting people over here. It, it's bad, it's really bad, it's evil in the alternative you don't get in what is not possible. And, and this is partially why our arguments for individualism and at the end of the day for freedom and for capitalism are not primarily GDP per capita. It's also GDP per capita, but it's primarily moral. It's primarily about your individual freedom. It's primarily about your, your ability to make individual choices. And that's why I want freedom, right? And yes, GDP per capita will also increase. But I want to be, I have a right to be free as a human being. Thanks. So we're cutting into the coffee break now, so please keep it brief. And um, if you think your question has already been answered, please sit down. Hi, so uh, regarding older people, and uh, I've heard the term mental calcification. Can somebody tell me what exactly is that? How can I prevent uh, that happening to me? I may be too calcified to know the answer to that question. I mean, I've actually I used the term, so it's probably my fault. Yeah. Um, I mean, I happen to believe that, you know, when you're young, you're, you're open to new ideas in a way that as you get older, you, you become less open to. Uh, partially because you've thought about certain things in a particular way along a particular path, and that is kind of established in your consciousness, and it's very difficult now to shake that and to move away from that. Also because you get busy, right? Um, you start a family, you have a career, you're busy doing all this stuff. There's a certain period in life, about 16 to 25, where a big chunk of what you're doing is figuring the world out. You're open to new ideas. You're trying to understand. And, it, and that's the point in which you can be rad. It's easier to be radical. It's easier to change. Now, there are plenty of people who change later, so the calcification is an exaggeration. And the way to avoid it, and I think we can avoid it, is to stay active, is to always question. Even if you think you are an objectivist, I'm an objectivist, I agree with Ayn Rand. Question that, right? Doubt it. Challenge yourself. Debate somebody who disagrees with you and let them ask the toughest question possible. Keep your, and, and apply your new ideas to a field that you've never applied them to before. Keep your mind active, questioning. And again, remember that the primary orientation is to the truth, not to some book, even if the book happens to be Alice Shrugged. The question is, what is true? What I suspect. I'll just add quickly to that. It connects to the question that I, we answered before about 
speaking with one's parents uh, you, and, and people generally, and uh, not just because someone's necessarily old, but the longer a person's lived, the more they've strung together a worldview, and it's highly integrated, and they see the world through it and sometimes don't even realize that they have it. And to unwire that would take a lot of mental work and would hurt. It would take a heroic effort sometimes to do it. And that's one reason why it's important not to expect uh, any one argument or even series of arguments that you make to change somebody's mind overnight and, and, and to give them space to think about things because it, it's a tough job to decalcify uh, if, for the people who are willing to do it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So my, it's my question is in line with these things, but more specific, like the la, the learning curve of this philosophy or objectivism or things what we talk is very huge, very high. Uh, how do you think what methodology I should use to benefit from the things which I learn? For example, when I read Ayn Rand like six years or Fountainhead like six years before. <coughs> That was an intense reading of one week, and it really, uh, so after that, every time I think of They want a coffee, they want a coffee break, I think. So there's a question about what's the most effective way to study a philosophy like objectivism? Yeah, well, it's, it's important that you're not going to get, get everything that you would want to get just by re reading a, a novel for the first time or for reading any of the books the first time. So it's important that there is, I mean, Ayn Rand has a systematic philosophy behind the scenes of all these novels and all the essays that she writes. And, uh, uh, well, I'll just say one thing. There's many things I could say, but but the Ayn Rand Institute offers uh, a program of online learning uh, called the Objectivist Academic Center. Uh, it's a three-year program, and uh, we take you systematically through the philosophy. We we give you homework. You, you get graded, and it's a great way to you know set goals for yourself in terms of studying it and being held accountable for it and learning from people who've studied it for you know a lot longer and uh, that's probably the top choice that I've mentioned. Yeah, but it, but it, it, a lot of you are busy. I saw you True. roll your eyes at three years. But you know, the essays, there's tons of content. There's a website, YouTube channel with lots of content and keep thinking about it. Keep, keep reading another essay and thinking about it and analyzing it, integrating into your thinking. And it, it could take you 10 years, it could take however long it takes to integrate the philosophy into your life. It, it depends on why you want to integrate it, in what way you're struggling with, what you understand, what you don't understand. But it's, it's just, it's like studying anything else. You have to study it. Hello. Uh, I have two short questions. The first one is for Mr. Lars, and the second one is for all of you. The first question is, uh, Mr. Lars, I googled your name half an hour ago, and I found out that you were born in 1963, which means that in 1992 you were 29 years old. Can you tell us something more about the 29 years old Lars? Uh, can you tell us something more about your beginnings, um, your fears if you had them that time? Uh, did somebody help you? Uh, I, 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 it sounds like a very, very long story. I would like to, I would like to do it in a minute at least. So maybe we should take it offline. I think that that's not the right time. Thanks. And the, and the second question is, uh, how come that the myth of Nordic socialism is still alive today? So alive that Bernie Sanders put it into his campaign to be a president of the United States of America. Because because. People use concepts today in very, very loose ways. Nobody defines their terms. Nobody knows what they're actually talking about. Um, and, and, you know, those who have defended capitalism don't define capitalism properly and defend it properly. And we attack socialism. We are often too quick not to define what we mean by when we attack it. So people hold these concepts as very, very loose abstractions. So if you redistribute a lot of wealth, you're socialist somehow. Uh, if you have high tax rates, you're socialist somehow. And nobody really thinks about what socialism actually means. Thank you. Uh, 
Carl Svanberg is sitting right there, and he's written a number of articles on this very topic. So find him and ask him more. And I'd say our prime minister was very upset when he was yes. when he was called a socialist country. So uh, you know, there's a little bit of disagreement on that, but but I would say uh, it is pretty socialist. It's a rather philosophical one. So on the first lecture, uh, we were talking about an idea that society's level doesn't define our identity. What Charles the talk is about, Get religion, nationality. Because it's impossible to hear or understand you. Closer okay. to the microphone. Um, on the first lecture, we were talking about an idea that society's label doesn't define our identity. Uh, it, it can be religion, nationality, gender, social background. So if we get rid of all different labels society puts on us, what will be left? What is the primary state of a human being who doesn't connect himself to any of social institutions? And how is he defined? And how does he know that all of decisions and values are not response to his background, but his pure free will? And can objectivism survive for a long time if like God's fault is real place and the, there are no social problems around because will we we have a space for like our self-development. Uh, I'll just answer that really quickly, I think, because I think the answer is sort of easy. The, an individual is defined by their choices. And those choices may involve certain groups that they join based on ideas that they adopt uh, and may be defined by a lot of other things, their career especially. That's very important in objectivism. Um, I'll be talking more about the connection between free will and individualism tomorrow, so that might be a good way to talk more about it. Yeah, and I'd also say this idea about it's not, I mean, objectivism is primarily a positive philosophy. It's a philosophy not about critiquing everybody else. It's a philosophy about how to live a successful life for yourself. And you saw, you know, Laws's uh, talk was exactly that, how to take the objectivist ethics and apply it in your business, for example but in apply it in your life, apply it in how you live. And there's tons of work still to be done on, on, on you know, uh, really chewing on that and fully understanding that. But objectivism is not about a critique. Objectivism is primarily about how to live the best life you can live for you. And in that sense, yes, it'll survive when the world is better because there'll be lots of stuff to do about making you the best that you can be. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.